We're glad that you're here today. Uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Acts, specifically Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 15 this morning. But as we begin, we're kind of in a unique place, kind of a transitionary week. We finished our series on parables last week. We'll be going into our holiday series next week. But this week, and then also on the 31st, I want to kind of do a couple of sermons out of the book of Acts that would kind of prepare us for the new year. And that's not necessarily something we like to think about uh, four weeks from uh, now is Christmas, just so you know. So you got three and a half weeks or so uh, to think about starting your shopping, uh, if you're like me. Um, but then five weeks from now is New Year's. And as we think about that, I was thinking about this past week and Thanksgiving. And there's so many things about Thanksgiving that in my house, we kind of do similar or the same every year. Like, it's probably been 15 years or more that, you know, I was on YouTube and I saw these videos of guys putting frozen turkeys and hot boiling oil and exploding. And I thought, that's what I want to do on Thanksgiving. And so I bought a turkey fryer and, and I fry turkeys every year. I cannot imagine having Thanksgiving without pumpkin pie. I mean, we just have to stop and go get a pumpkin pie, you know? Um, and then the day after Thanksgiving, we have a routine at my house. I go out to my shop and I load up, literally load up a, a pickup loads worth of uh, Christmas decorations, take them up my driveway to the house, bring those in the house. And then what I do is I sit and watch football while my wife, and in this case, just my daughter, set up the Christmas decorations. Now you might say, well, shouldn't you help? They don't want my help. Um, I've, I've helped kind of, and it's really obvious to all the parties involved that that's the best way to handle it. And so that's what we did this year. And I got to thinking about traditions. And a lot of families have a lot of traditions around the holidays. Maybe it's certain things you eat. Maybe it's certain places you go, activities that you do. Those things are not wrong. But when we think about God and the way he works in our life, sometimes we expect that God is going to do the exact same things that God has always done. The Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 19, it says this. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah and he says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now it's interesting verbiage that he uses here. He says, I'm going to make a road in the wilderness. Now that's significant because the wilderness is, is by its sort of nature, right? A place where there's not a road. He says, I'm going to make rivers in the desert. I'm going to do a new thing. Now, as we talk about this subject this morning, we're going to begin in the book of Acts in, in chapter 10. We need to understand that God is a God who does not do anything against his nature. He's a holy God, so God is not going to sin. He, he's not going to lie to us. The Bible says it, God is a God who cannot lie. He's a God who's, who's loving. He's a God who's all-knowing. He's not going to do anything against his nature, but he is the creator of this universe. He is almighty God. And so if we think we have God all figured out, we need to think again because God is also a surprising God. He's a God who will move in ways we didn't expect. 
And I want us to think about that and look at that this morning. In Acts chapter 10, there are a couple of visions that men get. There's a man who's named Cornelius, and he's a centurion. He's a Roman official. He's not a Jew, but he believes in Jehovah God. He gives, he's kind to the Jews. He, he gives money to the Lord. He tries to serve him and he gets a vision from an angel. And he's, and he, and he's this, this angel gives him a message. He says, you need to send for this guy, Peter. He's one of my apostles. And he's going to come and he's going to tell you some truths and you need to believe them. And so you need to go and he tells him where Peter is and he says, you need to get him to come to you. And then it's the next day, Cornelius has sent uh, a soldier and two of his servants to go to where he was told Peter was. And it's about lunchtime. And Peter's on the roof of this house, kind of a, a, a rooftop patio. He's praying. And the Bible says he's hungry, but lunch isn't ready yet. And as he's praying, he falls into a trance. And there is this sheet that is let down from heaven. And on it are these animals. And this voice from heaven proclaims to Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Now, there are a lot of things about this vision that are kind of weird to us. I was thinking about this, right? Like, if you're hungry, and you just really, maybe you, did, you skipped a meal, or, or maybe you just woke up hungry, and you see, like, an animal, you're not like, oh, right on. I'm just going to grab that animal, kill it, cut it up, start a fire, cook it, and eat it, this is the answer to my problem. Like, even if you're a hunter or something, that's not generally the first thing you think when you're hungry, you know? Usually what you think when you're hungry is you go to the fridge and try to find someone. If you're out somewhere, you're driving around, you're like, oh, there's the golden arches. That's where I can, whatever your, you know, fast food of choice is, Qdoba, I don't, whatever, and you can get what you need to eat. And so it's kind of a weird vision for us that on this sheet, you know, if, if God let down a sheet in front of us, it would be like, what's it called, a charcuterie board? Is that like lunch, adult Lunchables, right? Or pies and side dishes and all of that. Rise and eat. Oh, yes, Lord. But for Peter, it was these animals. And the thing that was significant about it is it was animals that were not kosher. They were not clean. They were not according to the law. And so God gives a vision to Peter. He gets a heavenly vision and a voice from heaven says, Rise and eat. Kill and eat. And in Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, it says this. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now, if you would, put verse 14 up there again. A voice from heaven says, Peter, arise, kill, and eat. And Peter says, I don't think so. Not so, Lord. You know how it's really a good idea when you get a clear directive from the one who, by his very words, spoke this universe into existence, and Almighty God tells you to do something, and you're just like, I don't think so. <laughs> I love Peter. I think Peter just says a lot of the things that for many of us, we either think or even are scared to think, but we still kind of feel that way. Peter said, I'm not going to do that. And before we get our too hard on Peter, 
I was thinking about this. I thought, well, you know, maybe Peter thought this is a test. Like God is testing me and I'm going to remain faithful. Because he was, you know, Peter was one who walked with Jesus, but then Jesus died. Peter denied him. Jesus rose from the grave. He, he was forgiven. He restored relationship with Jesus. But now Jesus has ascended into heaven. Maybe Peter thought, now God's trying to test me again, but I'm not going to fail this time. I don't know what exactly Peter was thinking, but what Peter was not picking up on was what God was doing. See, God was doing something new, something surprising. And Peter said, not so, Lord. But of course the voice comes and says, what well, God has cleansed, you must not call common. See, we cannot say that we follow after God and not obey his commandments. We cannot say we follow after God and not obey his commandments. Jesus said on more than one occasion, if you love me, keep my commandments. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. One of the attributes of a follower of Jesus Christ is obedience of the commands of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, we fail in that. Obviously, we make mistakes. We don't always obey all of God's commands in a perfect way. But obedience should generally be the, a hallmark of a follower of Jesus Christ. If we're constantly doing things against God's word, against God's commands, then we, how can we say we're a follower of Jesus? That we love him, that we're following him. God has to be Lord of everything. We'll read it here in a moment, but Acts 10, 36 says that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, it says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or, in, or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we all through whom are all things and through whom we live. Listen, there are a lot of people, matter of fact, I think most people in our society today, they just kind of want to pick and choose what they believe and what they want to follow. They, they just say, well, you know, I like this philosophy or this idea, and I kind of like this idea over here, and, and this sounds good for me over here, and, and, and I'll just kind of take all of these things and try to live the best I can. But my job as a follower of Jesus Christ is not to live what I think is best, but to look at the commands and the teachings of Jesus and follow what he says is best for me even if I don't fully understand that. Can you imagine? Here's Peter, a Jew, seeking to be devout in his following of God. And God had given this law. And he said, you can't eat this, you can't eat that, you can't eat pork, you can't eat certain kinds of, of shellfish. There, there were all kinds of things that they couldn't eat. And even the things they could eat had to be prepared a certain way. And Peter said, I followed these things. I've done what I'm supposed to do. And now God's saying, hey, have some bacon. And Peter's saying, no, Lord, this is not, this is not what I'm supposed to do. And so we should admire Peter's devotion. But we need to recognize that God was doing something new. That voice from heaven in Acts chapter 10 goes on and says, there's some guys here for you, Peter. They're, they're here and you got to go to Cornelius's house. His testimony has come up before me and, and you're to share the gospel with him. And so Peter does, he goes downstairs, he meets these three guys, he brings them in. 
They eat, they stay the night, and the next day they travel to Cornelius's. When they get there, Cornelius is expecting Peter. He has gathered his family and friends together. They're, they're, the house is full of non-Jews. Now, as a Jew, he really shouldn't have even gone into Cornelius' house, let alone be there and stay there and interact with all of these non-Jews, these Gentiles. That's not what was supposed to happen. But God had commanded him. And so he goes into the house and he begins to declare the truth of Jesus Christ. And as he does in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, he says something amazing. Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now this was, this was, this might sound pretty normal to us. There's no partiality. God doesn't play favorites. Well, to us, that sounds like the way it should be, right? We want things to be fair. We, we have a sense of fairness uh, kind of innate in us. But to the Jews, this was a radical thing. That's not how they looked at it. Genesis chapter 12, God speaking to Abraham, and he said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is where it began that the, the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, were known as God's chosen people. Now, if you're going to be anything, being one of God's chosen is pretty great, right? And God says, I'm on your team. That's what he says here in Genesis 12. I'm going to bless the people that bless you. I'm going to curse the people that curse you. I'm on your team. You're, you're, or, or you're on my team, whatever how you want to look at it, but you're chosen. You're, you're my pick. And the Jews wore that and took that with pride. We're God's chosen people. Even Jesus, in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus has an interaction with a, with a Gentile woman. And in verse 25, she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. That's a pretty harsh thing that Jesus says, isn't it? This Gentile woman comes and says, can you help me? And he says, do you want me to take the food that's prepared for the kids and give it to the dogs? Well, who are God's kids? He's talking about the Jews, and he's talking about this woman as a, a dog, right? I mean, it's pretty harsh what he said. And she said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So Jesus did help her, and the woman got the, the healing for her daughter that she desired. But what Jesus expressed was exactly how the Jews felt and operated all the time. They were God's chosen, and everybody else was not. They divided the whole world into Jew and Gentile. You're a Jew or you're not a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, Greek, Roman, whatever. It's just not a Jew, not us. Not as good as. You're not one of God's first round draft picks. You're not on God's side. Ever how you want to define it. And here's Peter, a devout Jew. And he says, I perceive that God shows no 
partiality. This had been prophesied in the Old Testament. It's quoted in Acts chapter 15. We'll talk about that in a moment. But in Amos chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnants of Edom. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. God is talking about the resurrection of the temple, but in that he references the Gentiles, the non-Jews, who call after the name of the Lord. And so the Jews should have understood that this was prophesied, but this was a, this was a mind blowing thing that the good news of Jesus Christ would be presented to a, a house full of non Jews. And what ends up happening in Acts chapter 10 is that the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They begin to speak in tongues, which in Acts was a, a was a uh, evidence of the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And Peter baptizes them. They're, they're followers of Jesus. Now, again, from our perspective, most of us this morning, uh, and I don't know all of your ethnic backgrounds, but I am not a Jew. I'm, as far as I know, fully Gentile. And so the idea of, not a Jew, receiving Christ, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, being baptized is not necessarily a revolutionary thing, but it was to Peter. Over and over, Jesus, the Old Testament prophets would say salvation is of the Jews. Jesus came to the Jewish people. And now God is expanding the message of the gospel to Gentiles. It was not what Peter expected. It was surprising. There were, there were prophecies, there were hints about it in the Old Testament, even in the words of Christ, but this is not what Peter thought God was going to do. And God often works in ways that are surprising. Now again, God does not work in ways that are against his character. God is not going to ask you to sin. God is not going to ask you to do things that are immoral. But he does surprise us because he's God. He's bigger than us. He's bigger than our thoughts. We get in this time of year and we think about traditions. And we think about doing things the way we've always done them. I'll be honest with you, coming up here in just a couple of months, I'll have been at Belmar Church for 17 years. That's, that's kind of mind-blowing to me, to be honest. Some of you are like, it feels like longer preacher. But anyway, I get it. You know what my prayer for our church is? That God will do something new. Oh, I can think about all of the things that God has done in our past. I can think about how God has worked to save people and bring them to himself, to transform lives, to repair families, to, to restore relationships. And I want God to continue to do those things. But I also think that we are living in a time in, in our society, in the things that's going on, where God is probably going to shake us and use us as followers of him in a different way. Are we ready for that? If God asks you to do something different, is your first reaction, not so, Lord. I, I, I'm not sure that's a great idea, God. Or are we open to his leading? Because what happened in Acts chapter 10 to Peter, while it might, in historical context, not seem all that big a deal to us, was mind-blowing to him. That he would walk in to a house of non-Jews and he would spend time there, eat meals there, probably lodge there, and declare the truth of the gospel and see that God 
desired to save these people, that he desired to bring his Holy Spirit upon them. They were baptized and identified as followers of Jesus, even though they weren't Jews. Again, to us, that might not seem like a big deal, but to Peter, he had never seen anything. He had never even heard of that. And yet God was doing a new thing. Are we open to what God might desire to do in our lives with our church? Listen, as, and I, I just want to say this. This is not like a message that I'm preaching because I'm going to unveil something in January. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, preacher's got a plan. I don't, (laughs) listen, if you're here and you think I have a plan, I'm glad. Welcome to Belmar. You must be new. But I don't have a plan. I don't know what God's going to do. But I, I, personally, I feel a stirring. I want to see God use us. I look at our, our, I look at the city of Lakewood. City of Lakewood needs Jesus. Man, we've got people that are hurting. We've got people that are struggling. And, and, and the things that we're trying are not working as a society. Have you noticed? So you know what we ought to do? We ought to get angry and protest something or, are you kidding me? That doesn't work either. Have you looked around? Well, maybe we ought to vote better. Yeah, that really, that's helped, right? That's how we got in this mess. Uh, Preacher, are you anti-politics? Eh, most anti-politicians, but not necessarily. (laughs) If that offends you, I'm sorry. But we don't need to vote better. We don't need to protest something. We need Jesus Christ to begin to change the hearts and lives of men and women and transform them into images of himself. And as he does that, our city will change. Our society will change. We don't need better laws. We need the Holy Spirit indwelling men and women so that they won't do stupid and immoral things. And self-destructive things. And I don't know how God desires to do that. But I want to be a part of that. I, I want him to use our church to do that. And it may come in a new and a surprising way. Because God often surprises us. He did with Peter. Last passage I want to look at this morning is in Acts chapter 15. Kind of the culmination of some of these stories that took place. Because God was also working through the Apostle Paul. And Paul was seeing that Gentiles were coming to Christ as well. That the Holy Spirit was working in them. And that got people upset. And so because even though the church was very new, they called a business meeting. In Acts chapter 15, we refer to it as the the Council of Jerusalem or the Jerusalem Council. But they got together because some people were like, you know what's happening? Gentiles are believing in Jesus and they're getting baptized and they're still Gentiles. They're still, they're not following the Jewish law. They're not celebrating all the holidays we celebrate. They're still eating bacon and the things that we don't eat. We, we got to have a meeting. And so they do. They get together and Paul and Barnabas, they testify in Acts chapter 15 about all that they've seen God do. And then... There are two men who really speak to this issue because they have authority. One is Simon Peter. Peter, the apostle who was with Jesus. Peter, the one who, yes, he had denied Christ, but he also walked on water. He had been on the Mount of Transfiguration. He had, he had been, uh, intimate with Jesus. He had, he had seen so many amazing things. 
And he is going to testify as well as James. Now, this is not James the apostle. This is James the brother of Jesus. A devout Jew who initially rejected Jesus' claims as the Messiah, but after his crucifixion and resurrection became a believer and then became a leader in the church of Jerusalem. And these men are going to speak in Acts chapter 15. Because there were men that came in and they said, listen, if these Gentiles want to be followers of Jesus, fine. But they've got to be circumcised and they've got to follow the law and they've got to do all of these things. And Peter stood up and he said this in Acts 15 and verse 10. Now, therefore, why do you test God? By putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. You realize what Peter says here? First of all, he says, why are we going to put the yoke of the law on them? We can't even fulfill it. That's not how Jews normally talked. Think about interactions that Jesus had. Peter himself, right, when presented with this cloth, says, I've never eaten these things. Not so, Lord. When, when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, he said, you've got to keep the commandments. He said, I've kept them all from my youth. Normally, Jews talked about how much of the law they kept. But here, Peter says, let's be honest. We can't even keep the law. And then he says, we... Jews are going to be saved the same way the Gentiles are, by God's grace. Not because we're Jews. Not because we've kept the law. But because of the grace of God. James stands up and begins to speak as well. He quotes from the passage in Amos that we read earlier. And then he says this in Acts 15 and verse 19. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. Not only do these devout Jewish men recognize what God's doing, but they say, this is how we're going to move forward. We see God at work and we're willing to change. Now again, I don't have an ulterior motive here, but I'm praying. I've told you before that when I preach, it's usually God kind of smacking me around all week, and then I just get to come share what happened to you. But I've been praying, God, what do you, what, what am I, even if I'm doing good things, are there things you want me to do different? What if God came to you and said, hey, I want you to do something different? I want you involved in a different ministry. I want you to serve me in this way. I, I want your children to be involved in this or that. What if God comes and says and brings something new to you? Are you going to respond like Peter? No, Lord. Thanks for the offer, God, but I'm, I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing. I'm comfortable there. God made Peter very uncomfortable. Again, it's hard for us to imagine that walking into this centurion's house would be a big deal. For, but for Peter, it was a big deal to walk into a Gentile home, to identify with these people, to eat a meal with them and identify as their, their friends, their, their associates. That A Jew was to, to separate himself. But God was doing something new. This was a fulfilling of the law of Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And then we need to understand that what James said when he said, listen, uh, or excuse me, what Peter said when he said that we're going to be saved in the same manner also is the truth, that we are all saved in the same way. John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
John 3, verse 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We understand that God saves us by his grace. But what if God begins to work and move in a way that is surprising? To us. I'm not saying that God's not saving people by his grace. That is the nature of God. That's how we come to Christ. But what if it looks different than what we think it should? I mean, church does, things do change, right? I remember when no pastor would stand and preach unless he was in a suit and tie. Whew, thank God those days are gone, amen? And, I mean, here at Belmar, I don't even have a pulpit, so I'm not even sure I am preaching. But what if God desires to do things differently? What if God calls and asks of you something that he has not asked before? What if he says Listen, I, I'm calling you to something new. I'm calling you to something greater. I'm calling you to a commitment that's deeper. Will you respond and say, Lord, I got a plan. Lord, I've got traditions. Lord, I've got this thing kind of mapped out. I know how my life is going to go. I was telling somebody the other day, um, actually I was talking to one of our former interns. When I was in high school, we had to write a paper in English class on what our, um, what our career choice would be. And I wrote about broadcasting, about being on the radio, because since I had been probably in middle school, I thought being on the radio was probably about the coolest thing someone could do. First of all, I kind of had a face for radio. I recognized that, you know, but also potentially maybe a voice for it too. And I thought, oh, I could do this. And so I was kind of into music and, and, and that a little bit. And, and, and I wrote a paper. And to do a series of circumstances, um, I got to be, I got a job on the radio when I, here in Denver when I was 19. I was pretty young. Like I got some really unique opportunities. And at the same time that I kind of had this career developing, God was also working on my heart because I was working with teenagers and he was talking to me about ministry. And if you've been here for any length of time, you know that I never thought I would be a preacher. And, and nobody else did either. Like that was not, nobody was like, oh yeah, I see it. Nobody saw it. It was not to be seen. I surrendered to go to Bible college and I went to Bible college and there I got a job working in radio as well. And God really used that very last job I had to show me very clearly that that was not the career path that I should go down. Some circumstances happened and I really, I felt like God just literally closed that door. And I was like, okay. And, and that was one of the, the steps that I took to kind of continue to commit to the calling that I believe God was calling me to in my life. But one of the things about that was I had a plan, and honestly, my plan was going better than I thought. I was ahead of schedule. And then God said, I have a new plan. That's hard sometimes, isn't it? And it doesn't just happen when we're young. Some of you, you have a plan for 
for the rest of your life. Maybe you're right into retirement or, or whatever, and you think, I know how this is going to go. And sometimes God says, mm, I have a plan. I've got something different for you. Are you willing to receive that? Or like Peter, are you going to go, oh, no, Lord. Listen, God, let me tell you how it ought to be for my life. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you're a follower of mine, obey me. Are you willing to do what God has called you to do, even if it's surprising and unexpected? Are you willing to serve him in a way that might be uncomfortable for us? This was the question that the first church was faced with. And Peter and James and other leaders who were being used by God recognized what God was doing and thank God said, listen, we're going to open up the good news of Jesus to everybody. And you know what? Now, some 2,000 years later, it's open to me and it's open to you. But how dare we think that God can't surprise us again? Let us be open to his calling and his direction in our life. Let's pray. Gracious God, Lord. I thank you for this day and I thank you for your goodness to us. God, I thank you for your word that challenges us, that speak to, speaks to us in a way, God, that sometimes is uncomfortable, but Lord, we know you desire the best for us, even when we can't see it. God, I pray that in the weeks, in the months to come, Lord, that we would be open to your leading in our life, even that if that is in a way, God, that we did not expect. God, I pray that you would bless us as a church. Help us to be sensitive to your leading. God, I pray that you would just bless us as we go from this place today. Help us to take the good news of Jesus Christ and share it with those we come into contact with. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.